Um, thank you very much. I, too, am very impressed um, that such a large number of people are here on a Friday night, and I really, uh, really appreciate it. So thanks very much for being here. Um, I want to start by introducing you to, to this fellow up on the screen, um, who's a Hawaiian crow, uh, otherwise known as an alala. And I know that he looks a lot like an ordinary crow that you might find around here. Um, but there are actually significant differences. His, his beak is thicker, for example, um, and his legs are thicker. And the Hawaiian Islands used to have uh, actually several species of crows, um, which probably at least six species that we know of. Um, and they probably diverged from the crows that we find on the mainland US uh, at least several hundred thousand years ago. So this is, in a lot of ways, a lot like the story of, of Darwin's finches, where an animal arrived on an archipelago in, obviously, we're not sure how exactly that animal arrived, but in, in very small numbers, and then uh, speciated out to fill different niches uh, and to be able to survive in different sorts of habitat. But the difference is that in the case of the Hawaiian crows, most of the species died out after the first humans arrived. So uh, whereas the Galapagos were not really inhabited until uh, Europeans arrived. In Hawaii, the first settlers, Polynesian seafarers, arrived about 1,500 years ago. And already they brought with them uh, species like rats, like the Pacific rat, that either outcompeted or potentially just ate up uh, the young and the eggs of these crows. So most of the species were already gone um, by the time Europeans arrived. This is the last species that survived into modern times. And it's native to the big island, to the island of Hawaii. And it, too, has been under terrible pressure, uh, both from habitat destruction, destruction of the Hawaiian forests, uh, and from introduced species. And by the 1980s, the population of Alalas was so low that the state of Hawaii began to take birds into captivity to try to save the species. And this turns out to have been actually quite fortunate because the last wild alalas uh, were seen in 2002. Um, and the bird is now classified as extinct in the wild. So this particular alala that you're looking at is named Kanoe. Um, he was born at this breeding facility, which is on the island of Maui. Um, and as the saying goes, he's quite an odd duck. <laughs> yeah, he, he was raised by people. Um, and he doesn't seem to really self-identify as a bird. Uh, or at least not as a crow. He does not see himself as a crow. One um, of the women who uh, cares for him told me that he once fell in love with a spoonbill. <laughs> so because of his um, you know, lack of identification with other crows, he refused to mate with any of the birds at this breeding facility. So there are now about 100 uh, alalas, maybe a bit more, um, at this facility. So let's say roughly 50 females he had to choose from, but he refused to mate with any of them. And he is pretty old now, in his 20s, uh, which is pretty old for a bird. Um, and so for precisely that reason, his genes are very important. Uh, so a couple of years ago, he was transferred to the veterinary hospital of the San Diego Zoo, uh, where he came under the care of a, of a reproductive physiologist named Barbara Durant. And Durant is hoping that Kanoe is going to provide some of his gametes so that she could rush back over to Maui with them and uh, use them to artificially inseminate one of the crows over there. So every spring, when it's mating season, uh, Durant, you know, who's a very serious scientist, PhD, uh, takes this bird on her lap, <laughs> yeah, and, and strokes him in a way that he is supposed to find extremely exciting. Um, and about a year ago, uh, I was out in San Diego, uh, and Kanoe had at that point not yet uh, delivered on this. Um, but Durant offered to introduce me to him, um, and he turns out to be a, a very um, charismatic, if uh, sexually confused, bird. Um, <laughs> so he has this very spectacular cage, sort of a, a it's almost like a suite, how's that? And we, we could stand in it. Uh, and he hopped over to us, and it seemed to me that he definitely recognized Durant. Um, he seemed a little embarrassed to see her. Uh, 
Yeah, that, that, that may be projection, of course, but he seemed to me to be embarrassed. Um, and Duran had brought him um, some snacks, he, um, these little mice, hairless newborn mice, uh, which are known as pinkies. They're, they're pink. And <laughs> so he hopped over to peck at them. And crows are very smart birds, as I'm sure you know, um, and they can imitate human speech. And Kanoe has a line. He says, I know. And it sounds um, a little bit demented when he says it, but uh, that's what he says over and over, I know. And to me, Kanoe uh, sort of sums up this, this very strange and sad situation that we find ourselves in. Um, so here we have this crow, one of the very last survivors of his species. Um, and people are going to incredible lengths to try to save this species. They've set up this breeding facility, um, you know, they're giving what amounts to uh, hand jobs to crows. <laughs> and, and people really do care about animals, uh, about what Rachel Carson called the problem of sharing our earth with other creatures. But at the same time, we're in a process of causing uh, what's been called the sixth extinction. We're driving more and more species like the Alala to the brink and more and more species over the brink. So Kanoe's situation seemed to me to sort of bring together a lot of strands, um, his knowingness or his sort of pseudo-knowingness saying I know, uh, seemed a reflection almost on his own tragic situation. And I ended up ending the book uh, with his story and he's sort of an emblem uh, for what I'm gonna talk to you about tonight. So what is the sixth extinction? Um, the implication, obviously, is that there have been five earlier extinctions, um, and that is exactly the case. So what you're looking at here in this graph um, is an analysis of the marine fossil record. And it's a little bit of a complicated graph, but basically what you're seeing on the bottom, on your left, it's time before the present measured in millions of years. So 600 million years up to zero, up to the present. Uh, and where you see those big dips, those are points when the number of marine families, we're looking at the marine record here only, suddenly dropped. And if you remember from introductory bio, a family is a group that's just above a genus. So it goes you know, species, genus, family. And if even one species from a family survived, that family counts as a survivor. So at, a, at the species level, the losses at these points were much greater than is reflected in this graph. So these five major mass extinctions, and there are also, I should add, many minor mass extinctions in the record, but these five major mass extinctions are sometimes referred to as the big five. And they are simply moments when, uh, geologically speaking moments, short amounts of time, when the diversity of life on the planet for some reason plummeted. Two uh, British paleontologists who have written a lot on this subject, uh, their names are Anthony Hallam and Paul Wignall, have defined mass extinctions as events that eliminate, quote, a significant proportion of the world's biota in a geologically insignificant amount of time. Another British paleontologist, Michael Benton, has used the metaphor of the tree of life. During a mass extinction, he's written, vast swaths of the tree are cut short as if attacked by crazed, axe-wielding madmen. So the first of these extinctions, number one on this chart, um, took place at the end of what's known as the Ordovician period. That's about 440 million years ago. And at that point, most of life was still confined to the oceans. There was very little living on land. So that was a devastating event for marine life, uh, but not for terrestrial life because there simply was no terrestrial life. Um, and the fifth occurred about 66 million years ago, um, and that's the most, by far the most famous. Uh, that's the event that killed off the dinosaurs, and not just the dinosaurs, but also a lot of other uh, groups, most mammals, most reptiles, um, snakes, for example, uh, and also a lot of groups like pterosaurs. Uh, and I unfortunately can't show you a picture of that, but I do have this wonderful illustration that I like. Um, and there's a pretty broad consensus now that this extinction was caused by an asteroid impact. So those guys are sort of reacting to the asteroid impact. <laughs> so to say that we're in a sixth extinction is, is obviously pretty serious. Um, and the reason 